you could make $10 million a year and not prospect. I say if you prospected and you're that $10 million a year producer, you probably could make 20 or $25 million a year. So I think no matter how good you do, how well you do, um, you get by without prospecting. If you added prospecting to your mix, you would do that much better because it's, it's so highly effective in getting in front of opportunities. All right, Bob, welcome to the Fort Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Chris, great to be with you. I was really looking forward to this one and uh, let's get to it. Let's get to it. All right. I had so much fun preparing for this because you have a really cool uh, story and I want to tell that today. So let's kind of start with how did you grow up and you said that you wanted to be a stockbroker and investment banker, and that's not the route you took. So how did you become a broker? So how'd you grow up and how'd you become a broker? Okay. Grew up in a very small town in northern New Jersey in Bergen County called Maywood. Um, Maywood had about 14,000 people when I was growing up. Just a small, small town uh, childhood. Still have, uh, have seven buddies that we all went to kindergarten together to still get together and play poker once, uh, once a year. And uh, uh, those are actually the only friends I have that are not in the real estate business. So a uh, bunch of, of old friends, good friends, uh, and uh, folks that, uh, that are not in real estate. My only friend's not in real estate. But um, you know, grew up, played, uh, played baseball and sports growing up as a kid. Uh, went to uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, played baseball there and uh, freshman year. I wanted to be uh, the next Gordon Gecko, like every other Wharton <laughs> kid. I wanted to be a Wall Street guy. Um, drove around during my spring break that first year, dropping my resume off at every commercial bank and investment bank I saw, uh, trying to get a summer job that would look good on the resume. I come out of a Payne Weber office across the hall. I see Coldwell Banker. I walk in there <laughs> thinking the place is a bank, give them my resume. Uh, they call me later that day, set up an interview for the next day. Uh, again, 1981, no internet. So I go to the library that morning to look up this bank, uh, see it's a real estate company and almost don't go on the interview. I'm like, I don't want to get into real estate. Uh, but they were the only ones hiring college kids for the summer, took the job. Uh, I spent the summer doing market research, driving around Morris County, New Jersey, uh, logging buildings for CB's data bank. Uh, went back my next summer, ran that summer program. Uh, went back my third summer, got my New Jersey broker's license and was an assistant to an industrial broker showing industrial space to tenants. Uh, and then when I got out of school, I started with CB uh, in Manhattan. Uh, so got into the business completely by accident, but uh, the luckiest break I ever got, I think. I love that story. Um, Bob um, is probably the most notorious investment sales, building sales broker with over 24 billion in sales. So I want to say that because the rest of the conversation is a build up to how we became there, how we got there. So you graduate. Let's just kind of start. Did you know you were any good when you first started? What were the things that you started to lean on early on in your career? You're like, I'm pretty good at this. And I think I can make a big career out of this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that there was an aha moment like that, Chris. I think what it was, was I... I really loved the business and I loved it from that that first summer job driving around looking at buildings or writing information down. And I just I, you know, always was attracted to the city as a young kid, even though we lived in Jersey, my grandparents lived in Manhattan. So we'd come into Manhattan once every month or two uh, and always like looked up at the big buildings, you know, and it was a, a cool thing. I just wanted to get into the city. And I, I knew that I uh, I was going to work hard at it. Um, I always worked hard at stuff, you know, whether it was uh, athletics or whatever it was I was doing, uh, academics, and uh, just started working. I remember, I think the first eight or nine months that I worked, I worked seven days a week. I didn't take a day off. And that was in those days, it wasn't like you did some work from home. You actually got into the car, came into the city because you couldn't work from home. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. So you actually were coming into the, the office. Uh, seven days a week. And I think it was eight or nine months. I didn't miss a day. And I just, I loved it right from the beginning. And I think, um, you know, I started uh, mid-July. I forget July 
16, 15, 16, 17th of, of 1984. Uh, we closed our first deal in March of 85. And, um, you know, I'll never forget that first closing. It was like, uh, you know, I had the greatest feeling ever, kind of like very similar feeling that I had uh, when I got my first econ exam back freshman year in, in college. I was like, hey, I got to be, I can do it, I can do it. And this is the same way that I felt pumped up about that. I felt pumped up that we got this building sold, uh, 1421 Third Avenue sold for uh, $3,180,000. And uh, it was the greatest feeling in the world. And then it was just, you know, uh, on to the next one. And uh, it uh, it's just been great. I, I still still love the business as much today as I did when I started. Well, I have to ask you, you sold that in, in 1984 for 3.1. What would that sell for in 2023 today? Okay, well, that was, uh, that was about 20,000 feet. Um, so I would say today, uh, it's probably worth about uh, 16, 17 million bucks. And it was 90, March of 80, 85, uh, 3 million, 180. Golly. All right. Um, when, when, when folks, okay, so we talked about kind of work from home and how things have changed, but you've, you've now, you're kind of taken a, a senior lead role. You see a lot of young folks coming in is the playbook still the same to be successful in this industry is there something that you're telling the folks that are joining your team out of college or maybe from another career on how to make it in this industry that's changed over the years or is it still work hard and yeah chris you know i i don't think things have changed all that much um the the real estate brokerage business i view really as a blocking and tackling business uh, it's not uh, rocket science. Uh, I think that it's a lot of very basic fundamental things. It requires passion um, so that you can work hard enough, even through tough times, because no matter how good you are, you're going to have tough times. Um, but you need that passion <clears throat> so that you can work hard. And then it requires discipline to do the things that uh, we have to do day after day, week after week, month after month uh, to be successful, making your cold calls. Uh, staying in touch with people, uh, focusing on market presence, building relationships, following up with people, all the, the things that, are, you know, are not really uh, groundbreaking, but the, the, the simple fundamental things that have to be done. So, um, you know, we just look for people who have passion, uh, look for people who have, have discipline um, and can grasp the, the concepts of what our business is all about. And I, I tell people, you're going to learn 80 percent of the business in your first year from a technical point of view, you'll spend the rest of your life learning the other 20% because I'm still learning things every day. Um, but you just have to be very focused and disciplined and do the things that need to get done every day to make sure you're you're doing what you need to do to, to be successful in this business. What, what, how do you define market presence? You said you got to keep up with your market presence. What does that mean? Yeah, market presence is uh, if you if you take the uh, the expression that in in real estate, especially in uh, private capital real estate, we're dealing mostly with private individuals and folks who are investing their own money. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. And if you look at that phrase, getting people to know you is dependent upon your market presence. Are you, um, are you making your phone calls? Are you sending out emails to people? Are you sending out hard mail, which is a very, very underrated uh, tactic for, for building market presence. Are you sending out texts? Are you meeting with people face to face? Are you going to networking events? Uh, are you giving speeches? Are you, uh, out in the public talking about real estate? Um, all of these things lead to market presence and of course, social media today. Um, you know, I'm a recent adopter of, uh, of social media. And that's another way to have market presence is just to, to do things that will make you top of mind for people. So here, here's why being top of mind is important. You look at, at Manhattan as a microcosm of New York. Uh, in Manhattan, south of 96th Street, there's 27,649 buildings. The average turnover rate of that stock of buildings has been about 2.6% over the last 39 years. And if you assume half the stuff that goes on the market will actually trade, that means at any one time, about 5% of the stock is on the market which tells you a couple of things. One, it tells you there's never really a lot of properties for sale. Number two, 
it tells you that on average, when someone buys a property here, they own it for 40 years before they sell it. So it's not as if you're calling people and every time you call them, they say, yeah, I'm interested in selling or d doing some kind of a deal. So you have to be there. What, what, when do people decide to sell? It's the old reliable death, divorce, taxes, partnership disputes, things like that. But it could be that somebody just made a new lease or um, that there's something that triggers a desire to sell. So you have to be top of mind. Because if you think about all the people that, that own properties um, and there's that one moment where they decide, you know what, maybe I should really sell my building, you have to be top of mind because the fact that the probability that you're going to call them on that exact day when they decided, yeah, maybe we should sell, very, very unlikely. So what you want is to have people know of you, what you do, uh, how you do it, and always be in front of them so that when that moment happens and they say, you know what, we should sell, the first thought in their mind is, yes, let, let me call this guy because he's been he's been all over me for so long. Okay, so I'll I'll ask the question. You're a broker in Manhattan, but arguably the most prolific of all time. How do people know you? What do they know you of as a broker? There's a lot of brokers in Manhattan, but what do they know you for? Right. Well, I think one of the things that um, that we always were very focused on, and, and let's go back to the beginning because that's when it all starts, right? Um, we always thought that. It's very basic to you get an exclusive listing, you put a setup together, you send that out to the market. We did that by by hard mail back in the old days. Uh, it was even before fax machines were around. So it was really just, just hard mail. Uh, and you'd put an ad in the classified section of the New York Times, which was like the multiple listing service uh, <laughs> back in those days. But we also, we created um, um, content. Uh, we were writing market reports back then. We were doing a newsletter back then. We were creating things so that, you know, and, and when we started, our value proposition was very simple. We only sell buildings. We only work on, we only represent sellers. We only work on exclusives and we only work in your neighborhood. And that was, look, I, I said that in 15 seconds. That was very easy to understand. So it wasn't, well, we're uh, uh, equity placement intermediaries. No, no, none of this. Most people, <laughs> most people write and talk at a fifth grade level. That's not a, a disparaging comment in any way. That's a fact that, that people tend to communicate uh, at a fifth grade level, and that's okay. But I think you have to appeal to make it easy for people to understand what you do. You know, people always say, well, what do you do for a living? I, say, I sell buildings. Right. I, that's what I do. <laughs> so uh, we, we would always beat the drum. Hey, we work in, in your neighborhood. We know every owner of every building in the, in the territory. Uh, we track every sale. We know every zoning change. We know what new developments are going on. And when we would go into pitch business, we maybe we had only sold three buildings in our career. But we we'd pitch against people with a lot more experience. And we'd go into an owner and they say, well, why should we hire you? Say, well, look, we know everything that's going on in this area. And yes, we've only sold three buildings, but one was down the street. One was right across from your building and the other one was right next door. And we know this neighborhood better than anybody. And we'll be able to be a better advocate for you in terms of convincing a buyer why they should pay more for your building. And that really got traction for us. So we were two young kids, didn't have a lot of track record, a lot of experience, but we had a value proposition that resonated with people and we went out and just it started to snowball. And then uh, we we had two small geographic territories we worked in. We put somebody north of us, somebody south of us, somebody east of us, somebody west of us and grew it like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and, you know, it started with just the two of us. You know, Paul and I started Massey uh, in 1988 after four years at CB. And um, it started just the two of us with the secretary, and we had 250 people uh, in four offices when we sold the business to Cushman in 2014. That's unbelievable. Oh, I have so many. Okay. Only represent sellers. Was that a conscious decision y'all made as opposed to only representing buyers? Was there a reason you chose sellers, or is that just kind of in hindsight, just how it shook out? Was there, was there intentional about sellers? 
No, it was an absolutely a conscious decision. We we think that seller representation is a higher probability business than buyer representation. Uh, and I'll explain why. Um, and there's not, there shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And again, not a disparaging comment about, about sellers, but <clears throat> overwhelmingly, um, uh, people who own property think their property is worth more than it is. Uh, and generally, uh, they, they become educated as to what the market is when they've had a lot of activity, a lot of offers made on their property, et cetera. And when that seller gets to the point where they're ready to accept a market clearing price, there normally are three or four buyers that would pay that market clearing price. And so if you're a buyer rep, you might have somebody that's willing to pay the highest price in the world, but there are three or four other people there. So you have a, a 25% or a 33% chance of making the deal. Um, we just thought it was higher probability business to, uh, to represent the seller. Uh, we also would only work on exclusive listings. And that's something that I, I tell people, as much as I love this business, if New York State outlawed the exclusive listing, I would do something else. Uh, I, I think that working on open listings is uh, is so against what I, I've i always done and the way I do things that I, I wouldn't continue to do it. And I even tell people, I say, look, if, if I meet with a seller who's thinking about selling and they own a 12 story purple building on the corner and they won't give me an exclusive. And the next day, a 1031 buyer walks into my office and says, Bob, I need to buy a 12 story purple building on the corner. Do you know anything? I say, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, and the reason is because no matter what, that sounds like a perfect scenario. It's going to eat up tens of hours of trying to get that deal done. And somebody may come in at the last second and outbid you. I, I don't think it's a good use of time. And if I bring that one buyer to that seller, that seller is never going to ever give me an exclusive listing because they're going to say, hey, if Mackle has a good buyer, he's going to bring them over. I don't have to give him an exclusive. So it's just been something <clears throat> I've always done. Uh, it, it just I think it's higher probability brokerage representing sellers exclusively as opposed to working on open listings or representing buyers. And not, not to look, I know plenty of brokers who very successfully do buyer representation. They, they sell properties that sometimes they're the seller of the property because they own it. Sometimes they're the contract vendee. They're flipping their own deal. It, it, a lot of people make money in a lot of ways. I just like to keep things simple for a couple of reasons. One, I don't like conflicts of interest. If you're only representing one side of the transaction all the time, you never have conflicts of interest. And secondly, I don't want to ever have to remember what I say to anybody. So if I'm saying the same thing to everybody all the time and just trying to maximize the price that I'm getting for the stuff that I'm selling, it makes life very simple. Bob, I was already a fan of you, but you are making me more of a fan as we go. Okay, we're going to role play for a second. Hey, Bob, we're buddies. I've got a 12-story purple building. I don't need an exclusive with you. Why? What are you going to tell me that if I'm on the hunch about this is going to be a deal breaker that you've obviously convinced thousands of sellers over the years why they need to sign that exclusive? What? Why should I sign this thing? Well, wh why wouldn't you? First of all, I wouldn't expect you to sign the agreement with me, Chris, unless I tell you first everything I'm going to do for you. So number one, I want to go look at your building. I'm going to put together a report for you, we'll come back in a week, and I'm going to go through that report. It's going to tell you what we think the property is worth, why we think it's worth that, and then what we'll do for you. I wouldn't expect you to want to give me an exclusive until you've heard everything I'm going to do for you in terms of representing your property. And if after you've heard all these things, you still say, I don't want to give you an exclusive, no harm, no foul. But give me an opportunity to explain why I think it's in your best interest that you hire somebody. And and if I sign the exclusive, what am I signing up for? What are the terms that I am signing up for? Right. Well, generally, the uh, the agreement will spell out what the um, what the duration of the agreement is uh, and what the commission agreement is. And on the duration, we'll we always give every client the right to cancel the agreement on 30 days notice. And the reason we do that is because invariably the number one reason that people are 
hesitant about signing an agreement because typically our agreements are for six months and the, the base term is a six month agreement. But if people feel uncomfortable about that because they haven't worked with us before or they had a bad experience with another broker or a variety of reasons, we say, look, you can fire us on 30 days notice. Um, I, I can remember less than five times in 39 years where a seller has opted to do that. Um, and the reason that we're, we're willing to do that is people say, oh, that's interesting. And when we started doing that, we actually made it part of our standard agreement. Well, as we said, look, we're so confident in what we're going to produce for you. We know you're not going to fire us, but we're not going to do anything for you unless you sign this agreement. So sign the agreement. And if day two, you change your mind, fire us. But we're so confident that we're going to produce great results for you. We'll give you that ability to to terminate the agreement for any reason or no reason at, at your your will. And that that usually gets over a lot of the objections, but to to get you to agree to hire me or to hire yeah, to hire me, I need to know what your your objections are. And that's the biggest issue the, because a lot of objections are not really objections. I don't like exclusives. My mother-in-law told me not to sign an exclusive agent. My attorney had a bad experience. Um, I heard exclusives are bad. Th those are not objections. You cannot overcome any of those. But when somebody says, well, I don't want to give you an exclusive because I hired an agent one time and they didn't send the information out to other brokers. That's an objection. You can address that. I don't want to hire an exclusive agent because the last guy I gave an exclusive to, I signed the agreement, didn't hear from him for two months. Well, we, you can overcome that objection. But drilling down to understand what the objection is really is the key to getting people to hire you. And just to confirm, the 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 real um, maybe value in the exclusive is, let's just say, okay, I'm signing the exclusive with you on my 12-story purple building on the corner. You bring me a buyer. And I'm like, no, I'm good. The, ex the the listing agreement's over, the exclusive. And a week after, I call that buyer up and I say, all right, let's make a deal. D what protection should a broker have? Maybe it's just like in general that this exclusive, what kind of security does it bring you, Bob, um, or or folks that you're training up in the business? Right. Well, that that's a relatively easy one. There is a tail in all of our agreements that say if you sign a contract with anybody that we brought to you during the term of our agreement, if you sign a contract with that person within six months, we still get paid. And we're going to send you a written status report at, at, at least every one or two weeks. And it's going to articulate everybody we've spoken to, who's seen the property, what offers we've gotten. And so when we, we send, you know, in order to have coverage on the folks that have made bids or have been interested during the term of the agreement, um, we, it, it takes very little effort because all we're doing is summarizing the last marketing report that we sent to the client. We say, here's our list. And it's very clear that those people we engaged with uh, it's very black and white. They're either on the list or they're not on the list. You have the protection period. And, um, you know, most people are, uh, are very well intended and tend to do the right thing. Um, there are some people that, uh, that, you know, you, you have agreements and contracts, uh, because of the, uh, the bad actors that, uh, uh, that, uh, exist everywhere, uh, in different markets. And, uh, you know, that's why you have uh, written agreements. But uh, most of the time, I find that, uh, you know, people are really good about doing the right thing. There's bad actors in real estate. I've never heard of that before. Every uh, once in a while. Every once in a while. OK. Second thing you said, which I know you're going to have some some thought here. We're in 2023. We have AI. We have text messaging. We have social media. We have crypto. But it seems to me that picking up the phone and cold calling someone still might be the most effective form of business out there. Let's just talk a little bit about cold calling and how you've thought about cold calling as it's helped build your career. Yeah, well, I, I think I'll, I'll make one one correction, Chris, and that that's that there's no replacement. The best form of 
of interaction with somebody is face to face. Nothing takes the place of that. But how many people can you meet face to face in a day? And how many people can you call in a day? So from an efficiency uh, perspective, cold calling is the best way to get to people, uh, most efficient. But th there's no replacement for face to face uh, interaction. And that's why networking is so important also. But, you know, the, the key, the key to brokerage, I believe, is is canvassing, prospecting on the phone. And I block time out always two weeks in advance. I, I block out two hour and three hour blocks of time where I'm just going to make my calls. I have at least 10 to 12 hours blocked out every week. If you don't block it out two weeks in advance, your calendar is going to be so packed of stuff, you're not going to have time to do it. But that that is prospecting on the phone is the gasoline that goes into the engine of the car. And if you're not prospecting, uh, I, I don't see how you get very far. Or at least let me let's say this. You're, you're not maximizing what your potential is. And you could make $10 million a year and not prospect. I say if you prospected and you're that $10 million a year producer, you probably could make 20 or $25 million a year. So I think no matter how good you do, how well you do, um, you get by without prospecting. If you added prospecting to your mix, you would do that much better because it's it's so highly effective in getting in front of opportunities. You said something, and maybe it was an article when I was doing research, and you said the 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 prospect that hangs up on you might be the most valuable prospect rather than the seller that always takes your call. Will you explain what you meant by that? Absolutely. So let's say I'm I'm making cold calls to people. And uh, I call somebody and I, I'm talking to them for the first time. They don't know me. I don't know them. And they spend 20 minutes on the phone with me. Well, aren't they spending 20 minutes on the phone with everybody that calls them? <laughs> right? Probably. So, so if I call somebody, I'll give you a Harry Macklow is a great example. Harry today is a very good friend. Uh, my wife and I socialize with he and his wife. I've done 17 deals with the guy over about $400 million of business. I called him for two and a half years before he would take my call. And I just, you know, I tried to get in, left message, left message. In those days, we wrote everything down in log books. I had pages and pages of nothing but left message, left message. So one day, uh, about two and a half years in, I called his office at, I don't know, six o'clock, seven o'clock at night. His assistant had left. He picked up the phone. I said, hey, Mr. Macklow, Bob Nackel from CB. You know, we have an investment sales division over here. I'd like to come talk to you about what we, I know you're, you're the guy always leaving me messages and sending me mail. What can I do for you, Bob? And it just, it started from there. And he was a very, very difficult guy to get into, but turned out to be one of my best clients. So I think that when you have somebody that's very, very tough to reach and you eventually can break through, that's a great client because they're talking to you and they're going to be hanging up or not speaking to, to other folks. So I think that, that that hang up or the more difficult person to get to actually is a much better prospect than somebody who will talk to anybody that calls them. Don't you also think they, they have a high level of maybe respect? Maybe um, Mr. Macklow actually respected you more. He kind of he obviously he knew who you were. He knew you had been calling. And by the time he let you in, or at least for the call, there was maybe an admiration. Maybe he didn't admit that on the first call, but there's a certain level of respect of this guy's been showing up for a long time. I'm successful. I know what it's like to to be successful. This guy, he probably sees something in you that he saw in himself. I don't know, but that seems like something you might find from people that are hard to get a hold of. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it resonated with him. I mean, he started his career real estate as a broker. So, you know, maybe he uh maybe he admired that. We've actually never spoken about that, but you know, I think that, that there are statistics on this that, you know, you get through on the first call a very small percentage of time. And as it as you get up to the sixth or seventh call, the probability of getting through goes way up. And so you have to, you know, establish your your base of folks that you're going to go after. I always tell people the best way to explain real estate brokerage is let's say you and I were going to go to Iceland and start a business selling rocks. I don't know anything about Iceland. I don't know if you've been there, 
but we're going to hop on a plane, Chris. We're going to go to Iceland and start a rock selling business. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to make up a list of everybody that owns rocks, make up a list of everybody that buys rocks. If the list is too big of people who own rocks, we're going to take the top thousand or twelve hundred owners of rocks. And we're going to try to establish relationships with them. So when they want to sell them, they hire us to sell the rocks. And then when they hire us, we're going to go talk to the people that buy rocks. It's that simple. That's real estate brokerage. I and I it. think when, when, when you have, when you have that thousand to 1200 people that you've identified, you're not going to get through on the first call to them. Some of them you're going to have to work really hard to get through to. But if you've identified them as one of the people that you want to do business with at some point in the future, you have to keep hammering away and hammering away. If you're in Iceland and you own rocks, don't be surprised if Bob and I come knocking on your door. Um, <laughs> all right, we're going to move into development. Um, you put up a tweet the other day that I have not stopped thinking about, and it was a war room of maps. And I think it said something to the degree of you have spent hundreds of hours and you map the whole city. Will you describe what you've put together and what the work that went into putting this together and why you did it? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think a, a, a big um, keystone uh, that started that whole process was the fact that I, I believe, you know, when I started, uh, when Paul and I started our company, everything was geographically oriented. And that geographic orientation was because the uh, availability of public data was very, very poor back in the 80s. Uh, today, you can go online and get somebody's home address, cell phone number, shoe size, whatever, whatever you want on somebody, you can get so much information available. Back then, there wasn't. So, you know, understanding all of the dynamics about a neighborhood was very important. Today, I think that uh, product specialization is more important because of the nature of publicly available data. So um, increasingly, my practice over the years, as I've been a generalist my whole career, um, increasingly it's been, um, been more narrowly focused on development sites and multifamily, although um, doing less and less multifamily and more development. When we analyze development sites, um, a big factor in determining value uh, is dependent upon what the pipeline of supply that's coming to the market is like. And what we found is it was very, very opaque data about what was actually being developed. Certainly in the hotel space, the office space, um, and rental apartments, very, very limited data about what was actually in the pipeline. Uh, the most robust data set came from residential brokerage firms who will track what condo supply is coming to the market. But even with those residential reports, there were um, there was big um, variances in the data because each company had their own definition of what they were including and not including what size buildings, where your geographic um, uh, parameters are. So really couldn't get a sense of what the real pipeline was. So for about 10 years, I wanted to go out and actually do a physical count of all the buildings under construction. Great idea. Who the heck has time to do that when you're so busy, when the traffic, you know, it takes you 45 minutes to move five blocks in the city with the way traffic is. But all of a sudden, you know, March 12th, we're told to go home for two weeks and there's this pandemic that's gonna happen. And two weeks later, you come back to work, everything will be fine. And lo and behold, you know, we're, we're out for the pandemic for a long time and the city's a ghost town. Um, so I said, you know what? Now would be a perfect time to go look at all those buildings that were under construction. So, uh, I, I spent about 220 hours in the field with sections of, of maps um, and highlighters, highlighting every building that was under construction, uh, highlighting every potential development site, um, highlighting um, assemblage sites. And in New York, there's very few just empty parcels sitting there waiting to be developed. Normally, you have to buy up a bunch of small buildings, demolish them and create a, a piece of land. Um, but went out into the field, um, 
um, did all this highlighting, went back to the office, had the team investigate what these properties were. And then at the end of the process, I ended up taping all these pieces of map together. And uh, that map now is 24 feet long and 12 feet wide and has literally every property that is being developed or could be developed uh, on it, identified. And since we did that work out in the field, we've been tracking every demolition permit that's been filed, uh, every new building permit that's been filed. So we, in terms of the pipeline that exists for hotel rooms, office space, um, uh, rental apartments, condo apartments, and then we have a fifth bucket that's miscellaneous properties, which are uh, properties being developed for healthcare purposes or uh, education purposes or anything that doesn't fit into the main four buckets. We have a very, very, you know, 99% accurate uh, list of everything that is, is um, in the pipeline that's going to be delivered to market. Uh, and we also have now, because Again, development is such a big part of my practice. Uh, I have information on all 649 development sites that exist in Manhattan, south of 96th Street. And those are the folks that I prospect to. I'm constantly calling them, giving them information on the market and, and trying to get hired to sell their, uh, their development site. Was there something you learned? You've been in the market at that time for almost 40 years. Was there something you learned after doing all this that you couldn't have ever learned had you not gone through this? Is there something you came out with besides knowing where everything is and there's lots of development sites? Like, what else did you learn that maybe you could have just never learned any other way? Yeah, well, number one, I think that that walking the streets is the best way to know real estate. I don't think you go on Google Maps all day long. You don't get the, that sense of having the real estate under your fingernails like you do when you're out there actually walking it. Um, and so back in the old MK days, we encouraged our our brokers to actually live within the boundaries of the territory and walk home a different route every day uh, so that you see different things. Hey, you just say, hey, this tenant just left or this building just got boarded up or, hey, what's going on? That building's being demolished. And you just get in the way of information that way. But um, the two biggest impacts on me by doing this, uh, number one, uh, having lived in New York for so long, I thought I knew every street of, uh, of Manhattan and uh, there were 25 streets that I was on that I didn't even know existed, uh, which was really, really interesting. Second thing, um, and this has been very helpful with my my writing about real estate career is seeing the 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 vast amount of land that's owned by the city uh on which public housing sits that is a a a, a huge misallocation of resources an underutilization of a very valuable asset and a, really a shame that uh, none of our policymakers have been able to figure out how to use this unbelievably valuable resource and maximize it um the Lot coverage on publicly owned housing is probably in the 15% range, where it in private housing, it's probably 70%. Uh, and we could do so much more with the resources we have if policymakers would just use a little bit of common sense. So that that kind of, it, it was just really shocking to me to see how much land the, the city owns and how few people, how relatively few people live on that land relative to how many people could live on that land uh, and how much more tax revenue we could collect and how many more jobs we could create and a whole myriad of, of very, very positive things that could happen. And I'm in the process of talking to people within the city now about trying to do something about this. But those, those are probably the two biggest things. These streets I never heard of before and, uh, and the fact that we have a tremendous, tremendous uh, asset in, in the city does in, in terms of land owned by the city that can be used in a very, uh, very much more effective way. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I, I, I went to Manhattan in February um, and there's an app called Land Glide. I don't know if you've ever heard of Land Glide, but it's amazing because it basically has mapped the entire country and you can go into any city and it plugs into their appraisal district and you can see who owns every parcel 
And as we were walking around, I remember telling my partner that exact same thing. I'm like, man, the New York Housing Authority owns like everything. And they own these huge pieces with two or three story buildings instead of. So it's funny you say that. Um, Is the map you created something that over time you can continue to update? Like it, you update it almost every day. Okay. Let's talk just a little bit. Let, maybe we can talk about a specific deal or we can just be broad, but how does selling development sites work in New York? If, if a lot of people are listening to this, they're investors, they have capital to spend, but I don't think they fully understand how much work goes into buying a development site, especially in a jurisdiction like New York. So maybe we could start from like day one. You've found a site and maybe a seller that wants to sell what all happens? Who's involved? What's at risk? Like, let's try and break this down to describe to someone the magnitude of what happens when one of these enormous buildings comes out of the ground. Sure, sure. And it, it is, it, it's complicated, but, um, uh, but not that complicated. One of the, one of the, one of the great things about New York zoning, um, uh, framework is that we are an as of right jurisdiction, which means that every property is entitled already. Uh, in 1961, the city updated it, its zoning um, resolution. And basically, uh, the zoning resolution tells you three things about every parcel of land in New York City. Uh, it tells you, number one, what type of building you could build there, commercial or residential, and, and um, you know, manufacturing, what have you. Um, it tells you, uh, it has something called a floor to area ratio, which tells you for every square foot of land, how many square feet of building you could build. So in an FAR of 10, for every one square foot of land, you can build four, the 10 square feet of, of uh, building. So on a, a 10,000 foot lot, you could build a 100,000 foot building. Um, and those FARs range from anywhere from as low as 0 0.2, 0 0.2, up to 33. So there's a very, very wide range. And then the third part, which gets a little bit more complicated, is the contextual aspect of the zoning, meaning what type of setbacks do you have to have from property lines or neighboring properties? What shape can that building have? Um, and there's something referred to as the zoning envelope, which is a, uh, a framework within which you can build, but you can't exceed that envelope. And the best example of that, if you, if you look at some of those uh, office buildings built on Park Avenue in the 1950s and 60s that kind of look like wedding cakes, uh, they go up and in and up and in and up and in, that there are actually angles that determine if you drew a, a line straight up the side of the building and then a line connecting the peaks of all of those setbacks, it creates what's called a sky plane exposure. And so in, in our zoning district, we have these FARs, but one of the interesting things is that let's say you have a 10,000 foot parcel of land uh, so you in a 10 FAR district, so you could build 100,000 square feet. Well, the zoning envelope may actually accommodate 180,000 feet of building, but you only, based on your property, you can only um, build 100,000. Well, the city guidelines say that as long as you have at least 10 feet of contiguous property line, you can actually buy air rights from your neighbor. So let's assume that on that 10,000, let's say you have a 10,000 foot parking lot, you're gonna build a 100,000 foot piece of land and next door, your neighbor has a 10,000 foot parcel with a one story building sitting on it, 10,000 square feet, but they also have 100,000 buildable feet. Think of air rights as one foot uh, lucite cubes that each one square foot cube and that neighbor has actually 90,000 of those cubes sitting on top of their one-story building. And as long as you have 10 feet of contiguous property line with that neighbor, you can actually buy their cubes and stick them on top of your building. So in this case where 
you have 100,000 buildable feet as of right, and your envelope can hold 180,000 feet, you couldn't buy 90,000 feet from your neighbor, but you could buy 80,000 feet from your neighbor. And in some juris, some zoning jurisdictions, some na- districts, you have unlimited height. So that's why you see these buildings that are a hundred stories on on you know Central Park South that don't have a height restriction to them. So if you were able to buy up air from contiguous properties, because if you it, and I hope I'm not getting too granular oh, here. But I love it. You, you you let's say you you bought the air rights from your neighbor, then that enables you to buy air rights from their neighbor oh. and their neighbor and their neighbors. You can go all the way down the street as long as you have a contiguous chain of these air rights that you're buying. So, you know, there are some sites where maybe your as of right zoning would allow you to build 100,000 feet where there's a 500,000 foot building because you've also not only have you bought air rights, but there are bonus programs you can take advantage of by buying, you know, um, if somebody creates an affordable housing building somewhere, they have these transferable rights that they can get. And then there are, are other programs within the city if you're in a certain district, like if you're within the theater district, in order to preserve uh, the the old landmark th- theaters in the theater district in New York, those theater owners can sell their air rights not only to somebody next door to them, but anywhere within the theater district. So they're they're very transferable, and that that is a dynamic that in- exists in other areas of the city also. But we're, we're getting very very granular with zoning. But le- so let's say the the owner of that ten thousand foot lot comes to me, Bob, I want to sell. First thing we're going to do is look at opportunities to expand the site. Does the site qualify for any bonuses? How do you acquire those bonuses? What do you have to pay for those bonuses? Are there air rights from neighboring properties that can be purchased? Or are there neighboring properties that could be purchased? Maybe that one story uh, building sitting on the parcel next door, maybe that owner wants to sell to take advantage of the, uh, the massive amount of building rights they have. You try to increase the size of the site as much as you can, because there are a lot of parcels in the city that are in high density zoning districts that are only 20 by 100 or 25 by 100. That's a a very standard lot size uh, in New York. So, you know, you typically like to build on at least 10,000 feet of land, if not 20,000 feet of land. Um, And those are very, very hard to find. So often you have to assemble a bunch of smaller properties to create a site that's large enough. But you look at all of those possibilities, then we we tell the owner what the their property's worth. Uh, and then before bringing the, the site out to market, we wanna do a couple of other things. One, um, we wanna have an environmental report done to see if there are any adverse environmental conditions on that property. Were there oil tanks that leaked? Uh, was there uh, some kind of um, adverse condition with asbestos or or something? Often there are there are uh, issues that properties have to deal with from an environmental perspective. And then this this aspect of the contextual zoning, where you have this envelope and sky plane exposures and everything, it's extraordinarily difficult to figure that out. So we we have uh, we often encourage uh, owners to hire someone to do a formal massing study to understand what you can and can't do, what setbacks you have to have, how much can you build, how many, how, what's the maximum potential that a, a site has, and so you need to do a lot of homework uh, with respect to that kind of thing to know what it is that you're selling, uh, and then we also have tenants to deal with. We have. Um, you know, often there there are tenants that have they're protected by rent regulation that need to be bought out. I, I just sold a a thirteen thousand foot development site on the Upper East Side that had two rent stabilized tenants in the corner property of this was four properties that made up this site. One property had two rent stabilized tenants in it, and the developer ended up paying them ten million dollars to leave. So it, it's there are a number of moving parts with these things, but they're kind of fun. 
Uh, they are uh, brain teasers. You have to make sure that you address all of these different issues or you could waste a lot of time uh, as a broker. But it all comes down to knowing what it is that you're selling. Okay, I want to go back real quick to air rights because I think this is something that New York deals with that most markets don't really have to deal with. Um, I know in Fort Worth, Texas, I've never heard anybody talk about uh, air rights. Are, are, is that typically something that obviously property owners know they have? Is Does that trade, do, do air rights ever trade if there's not a development going on? Like if I'm just sitting here going, I have a billion dollars to invest in the world, what might be something that would be valuable long-term? I would say air rights in New York. I'm not a developer, but I would like to own them. How do they trade usually? Yeah, the usually air rights are value. If you're just selling the air and there's no land attached to them, they typically sell for about half of what those rights would sell for if they were attached to land. And clearly, you know, often in an air rights transaction, Chris, there are there's only one or two potential buyers. So a lot of it comes down to who wants it more. Um, you know, if, if you think about it, there's an argument that you could make that the air rights, you should pay more for the air rights than you pay for the base. Think about the example I gave you where you have a 10,000 foot parcel, you can build a hundred thousand square feet and I'm going to buy my neighbor's air rights and stack those on top of my building. There's an argument that says, well, the stuff that you're adding the higher you go, the more valuable that space is. As you go higher in the building, the value goes up. So you should actually pay me more for the air rights. If I'm the seller of the air rights, you should pay me more because you're adding space to the very top of your building. It's more valuable than what your, your first 100,000 feet is worth. Then there's the argument that says, well, I'm the only one who can buy your air rights because the property next to you on the other side is overbuilt. I can't can't buy your air. The property behind you is overbuilt. They can't buy the air. I'm the only buyer. So you should take 10 cents on the dollar from me because if you don't sell them to me, you can't sell them to anybody else. And so th there are times when like a, a co-op or a condo uh, owns a little bit of air rights and somebody will say, well, I'm going to pay you a very low price because you can't sell them to anybody else. It's totally found money to you. You're never going to use those air rights. So, you know, take this little bit of money and you can beef up your reserve fund or do something uh, with the money, uh, you, you, which you're never going to be able to monetize with anybody else. So there are arguments to be made on both sides that it could be less, much less than half or much more than than half, but typically the air rights end up trading for about half. And to answer your question, yes, absolutely. People buy air rights to land bank them. Most famously, there was uh, an, an investor that bought the air rights associated with Grand Central Terminal. Um, and those are being sold off to different uh, investor groups that are uh, taking advantage of those. But yeah, absolutely. People, uh, people land bank them. And the nice thing about it, I don't think there are uh, real estate taxes associated with those air rights because they they can't produce income because they although they used to do leases on air rights years and years ago, you can't lease air rights anymore. You just answered my next two questions. You can't tax them and you can't lease. You can't do like a 99 year air lease. Um, are they just uh, filed at a title company? Like, how do you know who owns the air rights? It's a, well, the, the air rights typically ride with the, the property. They have to be attached to a, a, a lot. So if you're going to hold air rights and not only the land beneath it, um, you have to create a, a fee above a plane, uh, and create a, a separate lot for those air rights. Um, and, but once those air rights get attached to a piece of land, then clearly they are, they are taxed. So that enormous building at Central Park South, it's a hundred and something stories, the tallest building in New York, basically, I would imagine that's probably FAR 33 plus an assemblage of a lot of air rights. I, I think it actually is. I think the maximum FAR there is about 15, uh, the 33 density uh, FARs are over in Hudson Yards. 
Uh, but I think it's 15 there, but it in- included, you know, the, 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 the building you're talking about is built by Gary Barnett, uh, who's probably the most prolific assembler of land in the city. And I, I don't know exactly how many, but there are probably six, seven, eight different air rights transactions that went into making that building possible. And just so if we're talking about that building, how much time do you think from the day he maybe bought the first piece of land to the day they started selling condo units? Is that a decade? Is that five years? How long do these massive projects take? Yeah, it, it typically takes a long time. I don't know specifically what the duration of that particular deal was, but I can tell you that, um, you know, land assemblage is not for the faint of heart. Uh, and the, you know, often you're, you're buying things that, uh, you know, you may not be able to use immediately. You have to kind of have the intestinal fortitude to stick it out. But if you're able to put those sites together, they are tremendously valuable. All right. Um, you said there were 649 development sites that you mapped. Is that the most there could ever be, or could there be more, or it's only going to become less? It could be a lot more. Those, those are the 649 are what I, I consider my primary prospecting targets. Those are single parcel, uh, single owner sites. There are hundreds and hundreds more that uh, would lead would need to be created by buying multiple parcels. Uh, and those are the assemblage opportunities. So on my map, everything that's orange is that single parcel development site where the existing building is built to less than 25% of its maximum potential as of right based on the zoning. But then there are hundreds and hundreds more that are uh, in, highlighted in yellow that are potential assemblage opportunities where you'd have to buy one, two, three, uh, 10 uh, properties to create a site. Um, and those are, are much more challenging to do. And so a, a lower quality opportunity from a brokerage perspective. Okay. And then just to wrap up the conversation. So it, uh, again, I'll, I'll be the, 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 the site owner, um, and, and we've gone through and you've kind of, we say, okay, we're going to go to market with the site that I owned. And we've kind of understood all the nuances with it. How long does a, 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 a typical contract take? I know it's deal by deal and some are hairier than others, but in Texas, like we don't have blanket zoning, similar to what you said, where a lot of it's already put into play. I've sold a lot of land assemblages earlier in my career that took two years to sell because it was contingent upon all these entitlements. How long do contracts take in New York? Is it, again, just deal by deal, or is it these happen quickly once there's a buyer yeah, in place? It, yeah, typically, uh, you know, the, the marketing process is a hopefully a, a two to three month process. You know, clearly with market conditions the way they are today, it's a little longer. Uh, but once you identify a buyer and you agree on the price, the deposit amount, and the closing period, that closing period is typically 60 to 90 days after the contract is signed. And that contract is almost always non-contingent because of this as of right jurisdiction. There's no entitlement that you have to go through. Um, so it, it is a, it's a great process from a brokerage perspective because you can get the whole deal done from start to closing in six to seven months. Oh, I think it's fascinating. Okay, is there... um. We can go this way. We don't have to. Is there a deal that you just remember that was like a deal that you love to work on? A big one, a hairy one, something interesting? Like, is there is there one deal that stands out? I know you've done thousands to date, but is there any one that you'd be willing to share was just kind of an interesting one? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the, the interesting ones, uh, actually, the Real Estate Board of New York awards uh, most ingenious deal of the year every year. I've, I've won that twice. And uh, one of the deals I won that for uh, was uh, a small deal, um, a little 25 by 100 five-story mixed-use building on 47th Street uh, between 5th and 6th Avenues, which is the Diamond District. Um, if you walk down that particular street, there almost every retail shop, almost every tenant in every building is diamond or jewelry related. 
Um, and there was an owner there, a guy named Andy Brown, who owned the Gotham Bookmark. It was a bookshop in the middle of all these diamond uh, buildings. Uh, and he ran the, the shop out of the first two floors, uh, had uh, some apartments above. And, um, you know, he owned the building in a C-Corp um, and wanted to sell it. So he did a conversion to an S-Corp, had to wait 10 years for the S-Corp benefits to kick in. But the whole time he was telling people, yeah, in 10 years, I'm going to sell my building. And then next year, in nine years, I'm going to sell my building and so on and so on. <laughs> Um, and of course, as the, as it's getting closer and closer to the time when he could sell, everybody is coming into him, offering him all kinds of deals. And his head was spinning because this was a guy who loved books, didn't really know that much about real estate. Um, and he owned the property in my territory. So I was calling him all the time. He says, Bob, come on over. I need to talk to you. Um, you know, these people are driving me crazy. Everybody's coming in here, walking into the shop, wanting to buy the building. I want to hire you to represent me go through the process. And uh, it was interesting. I, I'd get a uh, a call from a jeweler because all the people that were interested were in the jewelry business. Um, and, um, you know, one uh, potential buyer would call me, hey, Bob, we'd like to offer X dollars. Uh, and uh, we, we want to also give the owner some cash under the table. Like go to Andy, Andy, this is what they propose. Oh yeah, that guy came to me offering me the cash too, but forget about him. Next guy, hey, we want to pay X on the books and we'll give some gold as part of the consideration. I go, hey, Andy, this guy wants to give you some gold. He's like, yeah, yeah, he's offered me that. Another guy with diamonds, all these crazy proposals that were being made. And then also it was interesting, we'd get you know an offer for uh, for, Four million dollars, and uh, then uh, an, an hour later, somebody would come in offering three point eight, uh, and they, we we sensed that people were were having shills bid for them to make their offer look better. They'd have somebody call up and make a bid just below what was just made, and then all of a sudden, it's like people were saying, "Hey, we know Fred's bidding, uh, but I'm a better buyer than Fred. Don't sell to Fred. Sell to me." And like there was so much awareness of what was going on in the market. We we're like, what the heck is going on? And so we we said, look, we have so much interest. We had, I don't know, 36, 38 bids, a ton of bids on the property. And we I said to Andy, look, we have to set a bid deadline and just have people come with their final, highest, best, and final bids. And so, you know, people would send me bids, I'd fax them over to Andy. And he, he has lunch the day the bids are due. He goes over to Burger's Deli, having uh, his pastrami sandwich for lunch. And the cashier says to him, oh, uh, Mr. Brown, I understand your bids are due today. I heard your highest bid's going to be five and a half million. Oh, my God. Like, what? <laughs> so we, we, we go and we, you know, end of the day, I'm talking to Andy. We have two bids. The two high bids are five and a half million dollars. Turns out that there were two different people were paying an employee in the bookstore to read the faxes as they were coming in and give him information on who was bidding and what they were bidding. Now, who thought who thought this could happen, right? <laughs> so so I'm like, Andy, we have to we have to do everything in a, you know, uh, I can't fax anything to you anymore. We have to do everything with sealed bids. Um and so he's like, well, Bob, what do we do? We have, you know, people are aware of what's going on. The cashier knew what the high bid was going to be. So I said, well, look, we don't really have a high bid because we have two people offering five and a half million. I said, this, this is too much of, uh, you know, this, this is too much information that's being shared with everybody. I tell you what, let's just go back to tell your attorney to start working on a contract because we'll have to send a contract out to somebody at some point. And we don't really have a high bid. So let's just say that we're, um, you tell everybody that you were not the high bid. Right now, no, the, the, even the two bidders at five and a half million weren't really the high bid because we had another bid at that price. So their bid wasn't the high bid. Um, so it was kind of uh, not lying with uh, 
being a little creative. Uh, and I said, we'll go back to everybody, say you weren't the high bid and we're drafting a contract. And I said, Andy, let's just shut up, not say anything to anybody and see what happens. So called everybody up the next day. Um, you weren't the high bid. We're drafting a contract. Don't hear anything for a couple of days. Then we get a call. So, you know, I, I bid uh, 4.9 million. What, what's the status? Said we're drafting a contract. Said, well, what happens if I would bid 5.7 million? I said, I don't know. I'll submit it to the owner, <laughs> see what he says. Two days later, another call from another guy. Hey, I had bid 5.4 million. Uh, what's his status? Is it, we're drafting a contract. What happens if I bid 5.7 million? 5.9 5. million. I said, submit it. I'll, I'll submit it and see what they, uh, what they say. We kept this up for three weeks, uh, ended up at seven and a half million. <laughs> and it was just, it, that, that is a, a typical New York story of, you know, people with the gold and the diamonds and the paying off of the kid in the bookstore to read the faxes and get, <laughs> It just was a crazy deal, but that was uh, that was certainly a not a big one, but uh, very very memorable. I love it. All right, you've been really gracious with your time. We've got a, a few more minutes. Let's just talk about the market right now. Um, and I just wanted to start it with we don't know what's you know we're, we don't have to compare it, but um, the last kind of cycle ended in 08 and 09. So I, I thought maybe a, a place to start was what was your experience like coming out of 08 and 09? And then I just want to finish it with like, what are you seeing in today's market? And maybe what are some things that are top of mind to you? So let's start with 08, 09. What did that look like for you? Yeah, 08, 09 was, uh, you know, clearly it was a challenging time. Um, you know, but I think that, uh, you know, 0809 was not nearly as bad as the SNL crisis in the early 90s. That I remember as being really, really horrible. Um, 0809 was was challenging, and yeah, people were running around opening up, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollar bank accounts because you didn't know what bank was going to fail next. Um, it was it was a definitely a challenging time, but it seems like the the market recovered relatively quickly. It wasn't, you know, it didn't really get bad until uh, into 08. And by 2010, we were already coming out of it. Um, so it was relatively short lived, um, kind of impacted all sectors simultaneously. Uh, and all sectors were heading in the same direction, uh, just to, to varying degrees. And I think that probably this is now the, the fourth correction that I'm living through, the first being the savings and loan crisis in the early 90s, then the recession in the early 2000s, um, then 08, 09. And I, I think that uh, probably the biggest difference that I'm seeing is that in New York anyway, um, different sectors are moving in different directions. And I think that a, a the reason for that is twofold. One, um, We've been in this in a, a correction state um, since October of 2015. Um, so, but for a, a 12 month period where things were kind of getting back on track, which was the second half of 2021, first half of 2022, um, it's been it's been tough sledding. Volume has been down, value has been down, um, and so uh, if you look at the different sectors today we see that the retail sector actually is a bright spot here, but that's because rents were going down for five years and they finally stopped going down, leasing activities picking up. Uh, and for the first time in five years, we're getting calls from investors that want to buy retail. Um, so that I think retail is a bright spot. Um, so we, we have um, that as one condition also, we have the externality of policymakers, and I think that uh, I've never seen a, uh, a higher correlation between public policy and the way the real estate markets are functioning. Um, you know, particularly relative to our residential housing stock here, uh, every piece of legislation that has been either implemented or ignored uh, since 2018. Uh, 
has done nothing but exerted upward pressure on rents. Uh, and so, you know, we have a, a situation here where, you know, things are not so great economically, but residential rents are probably going to go up 10 or 15% this year because there is no new supply that's coming to the market based on, on policy. Um, so the residential market is relatively healthy. Um, land market, it, because of a lack of a, a tax abatement program, which has, we've had for, for a long, long time, uh, it has expired. So the, um, the construction of rental apartments is virtually non-existent. Uh, and there, there's no incentive for a seller of a piece of land uh, on which rental apartments could be built to sell because the value is very, very low because of no abatement program. Um, so you have this upward pressure on rents. And then there's still some condo land being sold. But because of rate increases, uh, we've had the cost of construction loans is way up. So that's exerting downward pressure on land values. And there's still some trading going on in that space. But, you know, it seems like every product type is uh, performing and reacting very different uh, to what's going on. And that, that's the probably the biggest difference that I see today versus the corrections that we've had in the past. And, 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 if, and if you can answer this one, like what is going to happen to a lot of the office? Um, which I think you could make an argument, at least when I was up there, it seemed that's, that's just like totally obsolete. Do these become development sites that once weren't or like what's going to happen to the 40% sublease of class B kind of office that just isn't up to par? Yeah, that, How do that's you see a, that? That's a great question, Chris. Great question. I think if you look at the office sector here, you have new construction class A that is doing really, really well. I think if you built a a new office building in Manhattan that was in a non-traditional office area, it would lease well, you'd get triple digit rents per square foot and there'd be big demand for it. And then there's everything else. Um, the issue with these older buildings is there's only so much you can do to an older building to make it competitive to new construction today. For instance, you can't change ceiling heights really, you can't take columns out. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to make those buildings competitive. And so every owner of, of office in the city is looking at their building and deciding, does this building have a future as an office building? Does this building have a future as some other type of building? Can we convert the use? Um, or is this just going to be, you know, a not so great office building for the foreseeable future? And what's happening is that I think there is, there's a lot of talk about converting office buildings to residential. We desperately need residential housing at all levels of, of the economic strata. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the pricing of these buildings has not gotten down to the point where that's economically feasible in a lot of cases. So we need uh, help a after 9-11, the uh, the nature of the financial district in Manhattan changed dramatically, mainly due to a program that actually started just before 9-11, um, but really changed the nature of the market afterwards, which was a, a tax abatement program. We called it the 421G tax abatement program that incentivized the conversion of office stock to residential. So uh, on 9-11, on we had about 1,800 uh, dwelling units in the financial district. Today, there's almost 30,000. And most of those were created by virtue of this uh, this uh, tax abatement program. Uh, I've suggested to the, the governor and the mayor that they implement this 421G program citywide uh, to incentivize the conversion of a lot of the older buildings uh, into residential. Um, we need the, that financial um, support to help make it happen. And then getting to your question, and that would be great not only for the housing market because it would create housing, but it would get rid of a lot of the overhang of vacant office space that we have. Um, and then I think value is getting to the point where, you know, these buildings that would have sold at the peak of the market would have sold for eight or $900 a foot are getting down. A lot of them are priced at 400 today. 
and are not selling. And those, the couple that have traded are in the 300s. Uh, I think once you get that, that price down to 300 or below 300, it number one becomes more feasible to do the conversion to an alternative use. Number two, if you assume that the demolition cost for that building is 75 to a hundred dollars a foot, um, and you're buying it for under 300, you're buying it pretty much at land value. So somebody might buy it and just demolish it and build a new building on that site. Um, so uh, th that is something that the city is going to have to deal with. It's very, very topical. Some has happened, not nearly as much as we need to happen, but we need uh, policy support to incentivize that, uh, that dynamic happening. And are most of these buildings owned one off or they tend to be owned, the, the same owner owns lots of these. And I know that the, the New York real estate families and dynasties of New York tend to own a lot. But when you specifically segment this part of the market out, are a lot of these folks, people that have already owned it 30, 40 years, maybe their basis is really low and they can afford to hang on. And just like generally speaking, how are they owned? Yeah, g generally folks own more than one building. There are a bunch of people that just own one. Uh, but, you know, I, generally I would say people have two, three, four buildings. And then there are some folks that own dozens. But I would say the if you looked at the median ownership, it's probably three or four buildings. Um, but I, I think the the issue with a lot of these, and again, I, I said you know, that the average in New York, when somebody buys a building, they own it for 40 years. So half the buildings are owned for more than 40 years. There are a lot of buildings that have been owned for, for many, many decades um, where, you know, two or three folks got together, bought the building years and years ago. Today, you know, they're into the third generation and there may be 30 people that are getting checks from that building, um, many of whom are passive. And the, you know, the buildings are older. If you want them to be competitive from a leasing perspective, you have to put a lot of money into the buildings, renovate the lobby, the elevators, the windows, HVAC, bathrooms, et cetera. And folks are used to depositing checks, not writing checks. And so those are almost uh, zombie buildings because that you can't lease them because they're not upgraded. And you can't upgrade them because the owners don't want to put the money in. Um, and so what happens to that building? That's a, a real issue for a lot of people who are trying to figure out what to do. Um, and they may have to sell a partial interest in the building or do a long-term, um, master lease to somebody that's going to put the money into the building. So those, those, a lot of folks are dealing with those kind of issues now, um, with, with that type of property. All right. I've got two more questions. And then there was a gentleman that called you right before we started. And I know you got to call him back. What happened and why did the market start to tip in 2015? I'm actually shocked that you said that, that the market in New York started shifting in 2015. Was it just because it had run up too much or was there something that happened in 2015? No, I think we, we noticed the, the shift almost overnight uh, in uh, last week of September uh, going into October um, of uh of 2015 uh in that we we saw um land values were being impacted we saw the bids on development sites that we were selling uh down uh you know about 15 20 percent lower than we anticipated we also saw cap rates on hotels um expand by 75 or 100 basis points those are the two markets that we look at for shifts in direction uh, in the broader market because, uh, well, hotels have leases for one day, so they're highly reactive to, to shifts. And land is indicative of what people believe market conditions will be like three or four years from today when what they're building is gonna come online. Uh, so when we saw those shifts happen, we knew that the, the party was over and it was just a matter of time I think the reason for that was that the, the condo market had run up uh, so substantially. Uh, residential rents had, had been going through the roof. Everything was just so uh, overinflated. And I think part of the reason, if you look at the, the up market, it really started in, in 
2011 with value appreciating. And by the end of 15, you know, that's only a, a five year period. Um, that's a relatively short cycle. But I think that because real estate had become such a, a favored asset class relative to other asset classes, that so much money got dumped into the market that it kind of sped things up. And so a, a typical cycle that might be seven to 10 years occurred in a much shorter period of time. And then, you know, 2016 was the, the quintessential year in which your market changes direction in that um, if you look at uh, that's, that's the, that, that one year is a year in which real value and comparable sale value are different from each other, I believe. And there, to explain that, the market perceives that there's an issue. Uh, most people will not bid what they would bid previously. Some do. So when you look at the, the transactions that do occur, they take place at the old value. Uh, and the sellers who are able to get the old value transact. The sellers who don't get the old value don't transact. And so in that transition year, and it happened in 2016, you had value seemed to be going up, even though real value was going down. Value seemed to be going up based on what's sold, but transaction volume falls off the table because most sellers don't transact. And that's exactly what happened in 2016. Uh, and then from, from October of 2015 through February of 2020, um, the correction in investment sales was mostly um, on the volume side, the, the dollar volume of sales dropped 56% over that period of time. Number of properties sold dropped 54% over that period of time. Um, March of 2020 comes along COVID COVID basically converts this mostly volume correction into a value correction. Uh, in Manhattan, uh, we had three asset classes, land, hotels, and and retail um, lost about 50% of their value from the peak. Um, and uh, then again, end of 2021 or end of the first quarter of 2021, the first quarter reports came out from the residential firm showing that there was upward pressure on rents for the first time in years. Uh, there was good absorption in the condo market. Those first quarter reports led to um, folks wanting to get off the sidelines from the pandemic. Uh, I remember within a two or three day period after all those reports came out, I got called by 13 private equity shops saying, Bob, we want to get off the sidelines. We want to invest. Who's building? Who can we give money to? And that's why the second half of 2021 and the first half of 22 was great. And then the Fed starts raising interest rates in March. Doesn't really impact the market until August, September. Uh, but then, you know, the, the increases really started to impact lending spreads very significantly, uh, in September. And then, you know, we started to have the downward pressure being applied to values again. Mm. Well, I noticed when I was looking at your baseball card, your number one year was 2014. I think you did 2.4 billion that year. And I think that coincides with kind of what you said, the volumes, actually, if you look at that baseball card of yours trending with exactly what you just said. Yeah, it was, you know what, 2014 was was the best year. There was in New York City, 5,534 buildings sold in 2014, which was an all-time record by more than 10% at the time. It's still an all-time record. And, uh, you know, so people think Paul and I were so brilliant that we sold our company in 2014. But the fact is we, we decided to look into selling in 2014 and 2007 um, <laughs> because we... We uh, we were approached by a big global firm in 07. Uh, almost, uh, we, we talked to them very seriously about selling uh, for a variety of reasons that didn't happen. Um, but we, what became apparent to us was that uh, if we did sell the firm at some point, we were gonna be on five-year contracts with whoever the buyer was. Um, we looked ahead and saw that Paul was turning 55 in 2015, uh, our perception, was that the five-year contracts would be viewed as having more value if we were in our 50s and if we were on our 80s. So we said, look, in 20, 2007, we said in 2014, if the market's not in the tank, 
that's when we really should look at selling the company. Uh, beginning of 14, market's chugging along. We hired an investment bank, turned out to be, you know, the, the greatest year in the, the past 39. And uh, just totally by luck. It was based on Paul's age, not on any reason why we were particularly <laughs> smart. Life, life's like that sometimes. It's, uh, it's not a straight line. All right, my last question. If I gave you a billion dollars and you had to invest it around New York City, how would you invest that billion dollars? Yeah, I would, uh, I would buy land in Manhattan. Uh, and that is a an extraordinarily self-serving comment because I sell <laughs> land in Manhattan. But let me explain why I think it's a, a great buy. Uh, if you look at the peak of every successive cycle uh, for the best pieces of land in Manhattan, each peak has greatly exceeded the prior peak. So I'll take you back to 1986, 87, best sites in New York were selling for $125 a buildable foot. Go to 97, 98, it was 350. 06, 07, 750. Uh, 15, 16, got up to 1100. Uh, then during the, the pandemic, 2020, uh, values were down in the 300s. And in the first half of 22, 2022, it got up to about 500 again, and then started to decline when uh, lending spreads, um, you know, inflated. And so I think that at the peak of the next cycle, the best sites in Manhattan are going to be selling for 13 or 1400 dollars a foot. I expect that will probably happen 26, 27. Uh, and I think you can buy those sites today for four or 500 a foot. So I think it's a uh, a 2x, 3x, maybe 4x uh, on your investment of and buy the land, demo the buildings, put up a wall around it, get your real estate taxes down based on the demolition of the buildings. And there's no management, there's no headache, no nothing. And that's what I would do with the billion dollars. And I think, you know, I'm going to take a look at all of the land that sells in Manhattan in 2023 and then take a look at what all of those sites are worth in 2026. And I think you're going to see a massive, massive increase in the uh, in the value. Well, I hope you'll join me in 2026. We'll do a round two and we'll start that conversation with where did these sites uh, end up trading? That'd be a fun way to start. Bob, thanks so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed getting to know you. And, and um, yeah, this was a pleasure. Yeah, Chris, great to be with you. Uh, fantastic stuff. Keep up the great work. Love your your podcasts and uh, and following you on social media. It's great and great, great getting to know you a little bit.